there's a real movement in theological interpretation about hearing the text. And it's that, again, it's that humble posture, that posture of listening to an authoritative voice that's speaking. But as Professor Reinhardt noted, it's speaking in this text and not in other texts. And it's in this text and not in our own hobby horses and interests. Welcome back to Roundtable, episode 22. I'm Jared Luchibor. This is part two of our series on biblical studies. Last time, our participating faculty talked a little bit about languages and how here at Mid-America Reformed Seminary, we have a very robust introduction to the biblical languages. And we do a lot with those, but as we continue to talk about biblical studies, we're, we're now forging ahead and moving now into other kinds of things that our faculty do here in their own academic work, especially as it relates to biblical studies courses that are taken by the students. So we're going to take some time to look at what instruction at Mid-America looks like, uh, particularly in the classes in the Biblical Division. Taking part once again in speaking order, our Assistant Professor of Old Testament, Reverend Andrew Compton, Associate Professor of New Testament, Dr. Marcus Minninger, and Associate Professor of Old Testament, Reverend Mark Vanderhart. Well, I would say that our overall emphasis in the biblical studies department, at least the way I would tend to think of it, is learning to make the text central to uh, our activity as ministers or as mm. whatever it is that the Lord is calling us to do, uh, that the text of Scripture would uh, be central to that. Uh, we use a lot of other tools. Uh, we do an extensive study of systematic theology, apologetics, church history, uh, practical theology or ministerial studies, and other topics as well. But in all of these, uh, still, uh, sola scriptura, right? The, the, the scripture alone is our sole infallible rule for faith and practice. And so mm-hmm. we need to make that text itself central. Yeah. We need to practice then seeking to lead out the meaning of the text uh, of any given passage of, of Scripture. That's what exegesis really means, literally, to, to bring out the meaning, meaning from a text rather than eisegesis, where we're sort of imposing a meaning, uh, putting it into the text. Uh, and to put that more simply, you know, I, I talk to my students about uh, we need to uh, learn to be better, more receptive, and more perceptive listeners, that we're perceiving more fully what's in the text, uh, and that we're becoming more and more receptive to it, appreciative of it, uh, appropriating it both for ourselves and for uh, our, our use for other people in the ministry. Uh, and so there's a lot of hard work that goes into that, a lot of scholarly tools that we try to um, equip our students with uh, to get into the text and to stay close to the text. We really want uh, students doing close reading and don't just come to the text and say, you know, oh, yeah, I remember this. I know what it says. Yeah. Uh, oh, but, I saw how this verse was used to defend this doctrine. And- right, exactly. And so right away, you know, I say that a lot of times uh, we get uh, into a habit of where a word or phrase or, or verse in scripture is like a hypertext, uh, hmm. uh, sorry, a, a hyperlink right, where, right. you know, we, we sort of click on it briefly and all of a sudden we're off somewhere else to a, a, another discussion somewhere uh, on the blogosphere or in churches, et cetera. And certainly we want to use scripture for all the different things that we're doing today. But before we can use it, we need to know what it says. Mm -hmm. And to know what it says, to continue to pour ourselves into it, uh, to know it more closely, we uh, use a lot of tools. We talked about translation already with the use of the biblical languages, uh, analysis of structure of the language, studying the historical context of passages, uh, using literary and rhetorical categories uh, to think about the verbiage of uh, the passages that we interpret. And we do spend a lot, if I can throw this in too, I mean, we we spend a lot of time here talking about what it means that this is literature. Right. You know, Hebrew and Greek is not acting, like you said in our last podcast, people who thought it was a Holy Spirit language or right. something. Right. Now, it, it functions like a lot of literature of its time and also like a lot of literature of today. You know, there's there's stories that progress over through a, through a complication of a plot, leads it to a to a climax, and then there's a resolution, right? There's, there's these same kinds of things at work. The tools that the biblical writers use are are generally uh, very similar, analogous to the tools that other authors use. Uh, the difference isn't 
that it uses some different language or uh, entirely different way of speaking, but the difference is who's saying it uh, and what's being said. In other words, that yeah. God is superintending over this authorship process to bring about a fully inspired and inerrant uh, text that reveals him in a unique way that nothing else does. Uh, but we still have to take up a lot of tools uh, to look at what he's given, tools that are similar to what you might use in a, in a history department or a literature mm-hmm. department uh, or uh, even a philosophy department, um, and yet, of course, applied in a distinctive way uh, to these particular texts. I know you, you teach, uh, Professor Menninger teaches our, our hermeneutics course. This is a, generally in our first year, and you really you really are beginning to position our students with some of these tools in hand. How, how have you typically gone about doing that? How do you approach even that, that, uh, that course and the task of hermeneutics here so that by the time they get into our exegetical courses, they, they have a lot of these tools, at least a, a basic understanding of how many of them work? Well, that's a good question. There's a lot, a lot of things that could be said about that. I mean, I think the overall goal in my mind, and, and this applies to the, the t- class in biblical interpretation itself, but really to all the classes, is I want to instill in the students an ability and a desire to think uh, and to think hermeneutically, to think interpretively, uh, not to take the text as obvious uh, mm-hmm. on the face of things uh, and and to uh, a lot of times, particularly people who have grown up in the church, uh been through Sunday school, you know, for years, et cetera, uh, we can sort of uh, feel like we know what to expect from the Bible, but uh, there's a a certain process of, in a sense, defamiliarizing ourselves with Scripture, uh, looking back into its original context more thoroughly, including with regard to ways that that original context is quite different from our own. Uh, And then, of course, uh, slowing down to say... um, let me not just assume myself and my own uh, categories of thought, uh, but I need to try to be alert to, this is one of the most difficult things that you can do, uh, to, to, to learn to do, is to begin to recognize that you're not seeing certain things. It's very difficult to see mm. what you don't see, right? Yeah, it's, right it's true right. for all of us. Um, so we need to learn to decenter ourselves and our own perspective, our own assumptions. Uh, a lot of times that comes down to um, not taking our immediate situation and our own experience as the principal and first context within which we think of scripture. Uh, uh, But instead to go, to go back and uh, to think about that original context more fully. um, When you look through the, the history of interpretation in the church, uh, it's very interesting to see uh, my dissertation in, in Romans. And so, um, looking at that closely, uh, interpretation in the, in the patristic period, interpretation in the medieval or reformation period, and subsequently different stages in, in modern interpretation. Uh, every age of interpreters has tended to think that the big issue that was percolating uh, in, in everyone's discussions in their age is what Romans was about. <laughs> and so you just see this this poor text that keeps uh, getting turned this way and that way, whether that's uh, the uh, discussions of, um, you know, the two natures of Christ or discussions of apologetic uh, against, uh, of, of Christians trying to defend themselves against Jewish um, mm-hmm. critics in the early church or think about the medieval scholastics and et cetera. And then, of course, today we get a lot of social interpreters who want to make everything about uh, sort of reconciliation between mm-hmm. people and that Romans is all about that. Uh, a lot of other variations in between. Uh, but it's just an, it's just a case study for how a lot of times what's on our mind is what we think we find in the text. Uh, and, and maybe we did, but maybe uh, we were asking our question and we thought we were getting an answer from the text, but the text was actually answering a different question. Uh, and we weren't attentive to that. Um, in, in preaching, you get this too, where, you know, pastors, you listen to them and, and they're always coming back to the same topics over and over. This kind of just topics of particular interest to them. Uh, maybe in their worst moments, we might call those hobby horses. We want to <laughs> decenter those things <clears throat> to the extent that the Bible may be doing a lot of other things and talking a lot, a lot of other topics, asking a lot and answering a lot of other questions, sure, uh, sure. learning to um, be sensitive to that. But even your approach, broadly speaking, assumes, I think you're correct, but it assumes that 
the superiority and primacy of the text. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas there are a lot of approaches out there in which the reader mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, or maybe the author, but the reader especially is primary. The text, I, I have an ideology and I want to read the text in the light of that ideology. And Professor Minninger is saying, no, the text has to stand supreme and we need to learn to listen to it. Yeah, it's interesting how even that that reader-focused kind of approach plays out in different ways. I mean, what Professor Menninger was just even describing are, are how even different Christian groups have have tried to read these these books with a with more of an eye to their own on you know the the present theological debates they're facing. But even in, in on the critical side of things, and we'll say a little more about critical scholarship and 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 ways we can engage with that uh, profitably and things we we push back against, but. But uh, there too, there can be some incredibly idiosyncratic reader type approaches where uh, where a particular book is being uh, mined for um, uh, how the book uh, may support. Um, oh, I think of a of a uh, a book on economics in the Old Testament that was very much from a Marxist perspective. It was a Marxist reading of ancient Israel's economy, and it's not really. We're not really reading the text for what the text may tell us about what types of glimpses into the Israelite economy we might have. We're very much approaching it through this Marxist grid. But you can also see that kind of uh, reader-centeredness, or I, I should even say, in all these things, a lot of them can flourish uh, when, when that uh, revelatory element is minimized. I mean, this text comes as revelation from God. You know, it is his word. And that's what, what stood out to me about uh, learning to hear the text. And I know that Craig Bartholomew, who lectured for us a few months ago, has has used that language a lot too. And there's a real movement in theological interpretation about hearing the text. And it's that, again, it's that humble posture, that posture of listening to an authoritative voice that's speaking but as Professor Reinhardt noted, it's speaking in this text and not in other texts, and it's in this text and not in our own hobby horses and interests. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, as we try to get into the, the text and very close reading of it, um, our biblical courses begin with typical introductory things. We look at uh, the canon of the Old Testament, the canon of the New Testament, when were, when, uh, how did these particular groups of writings emerge, when, did, when were they recognized as a, a close and complete body of, of writings, etc. Mm -hmm. We look at text criticism to look at, uh, which is just a fancy word for studying the, um, the existing manuscripts that we have mm -hmm. of the biblical uh, writings themselves. Uh, trying to uh, figure out what to do in areas in which those existing copies uh, differ from one another. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. We start to look then at historical backgrounds and learn about uh, ancient Mesopotamia, about uh, ancient uh, the ancient Roman Empire, etc. And then we have uh, exegesis courses that, well, we have the biblical interpretation class, which we've, we've talked a little bit about. Right, right. And then, then we springboard into the upper level classes for, uh, you'll take an exegesis class in each of the major areas of the Old Testament and of the New Testament. And um, I think, you know, my approach to that, different, different people differ, but is uh, really to try to say, what are the distinct defining structures of thought in uh, any given uh, corpus of writing or individual book. Mm. If we're looking at the P Apostle Paul's writings, uh, Herman Ritterboss mm. uh, talks uh, about uh, what is the central corridor of the large house of Paul's thought. Mm. If Paul's mm. thought is uh, a large, uh, many-roomed uh, house, uh, uh, what is that central hallway that connects all all of those rooms, just to use kind of a spatial metaphor. And I've sure. kind of taken that as something of my mandate, in a sense, in, in each of the classes uh, on exegesis is to say, you know, what are the, the central structures of thought and concerns in, say, Jesus's preaching in the Synoptic Gospels uh, or, in, or in John? Uh, what are the what it was central to understanding Hebrews mm. uh, and other texts, um, and so you really want to explore the different voices that God has used, uh, and, and and they are quite distinct. Mm. 
Oh, most of the time, um, students are relatively told. unaware of that, or at least you know they, they have a sense of it, but they're somewhat inexperienced at really delving into that, how James and Paul speak quite differently, and Hebrews and Paul speak quite differently, et cetera. And of course, we have uh, similar things on the Old Testament side. I know when um, I'm approaching the various exegesis courses, I've found that now our Old Testament uh, courses are structured somewhat redemptive historically. And we'll say a little bit about biblical theology in, in a moment here, because biblical theology is a, a major concern we have here in our in our uh, education. Um, but we have it structured of revelation in the period um, before the monarchy, revelation in the period of the monarchy, and revelation in the period uh, of uh, the, the exilic and post-exilic period. Now, it doesn't overlap uh, quite right. I'm kind of covering Deuteronomy a little bit right now in my class on the monarchy, but part of that's because of how Deuteronomy influences these later historical books very directly. And in a lot of ways, Deuteronomy acts almost more like an introduction to the historical books uh, than it does a conclusion to the Pentateuch, although those aren't completely at odds with one another. It's really perfectly positioned to transition between those books. But I find in those classes, too, I'm able to, uh, for example, in the exilic and post-exilic class, we also talk about poetry. So we spend a lot of time going through how to read poetry, how to read Hebrew poetry. Hebrew poetry is not like, you know, limericks, right? There once was a man from St. Ives, you know, who didn't have seven wives or something. I don't know. You know, <laughs> I thought Hebrew, he should have, but he may have. That could have, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, Hebrew poetry doesn't always work quite that way. And yet there's there's conventions and things that enable us to then learn how to see the poetic structure of a psalm. And so not only are we talking about the contents of, of those poetical books, but even the techniques used to interpret them correctly. Or uh, when we do the pre-monarchy class, mostly focusing on the Pentateuch, we devote a large portion of the class to unpacking a distinctly Reformed biblical theology. Now here we, we tend to do that uh, very much in the, in the tradition of Gerhardus Voss, uh, on the New Testament side, Herman Ritterboss, uh, but but we spend a lot of time going through that and then walking through passages and walking through the books as they as those books help to um, to relate to that method. Or in the class now on monarchy, uh, we spend a, a good chunk of time unpacking narrative, how Hebrew narrative works, and how how uh, temporal transitions or time or characterization, all these things, and then move into uh, other other passages. And it really enables us to look at this whole section of the canon, this Old Testament, um, not only reading its contents, and, and as you were getting at, uh, seeing those, those main corridors, I like that expression, uh, but even unpacking in a little more detail some of the techniques that best enable us to um, to observe and interact with those corridors. Right. You have to go from the, the, the main structures of thought down to the individual books and then individual details within books, right? Mm -hmm. So you can you study Pauline theology in a sense. That's that's studying the, the house structure as a whole mm -hmm. and, and sort of what its architectural blueprint is like, uh, what that central corridor may be uh, to, to gain access to all the rooms. But then you have to study individual rooms, right? We don't yeah. just preach Pauline theology. We preach from Galatians or we preach mm -hmm. uh, from 1 mm -hmm. Corinthians, etc. And so uh, now you have to look at uh, audience and occasion and and uh, date, et cetera, um, mm -hmm. particular rhetorical conventions, the purpose of writing, uh, very creative things that Paul or any other biblical author is doing. Um, you had mentioned uh, biblical theology. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's so much you could say about that. It could do a, a podcast easily on, on just that topic, but um, actually, we I know we hope to in a couple of months. We'd like to unpack biblical theology more, uh, maybe specifically how we see the Old Testament its relation to to Christianity. But uh, well, I don't yeah. know anything about that. I <laughs> yeah. I only have heard that there was an Old Testament, but. <laughs> Um, my Old Testament colleagues have only ever heard that there was a Holy Spirit, I yeah. guess, <laughs> just like those in Acts, the disciples in Acts 20. The Old 20. Testament is where it's at. Everything else is commentary. There you go. Well, there's some truth to that. Um, 
But I was going to say that I think biblical theology, I mean, there's a lot of ways to come at it, but um, to me, part of it, again, goes back to decentering ourselves yeah. and our own immediate concerns to make sure that we are reading the text's own concerns first. And a lot of times we come to the Bible with a question, right? What should I do with my rebellious teenager? Or mm. how do I reconcile these people in the church? Or um, you know, it, what's the answer to this theological debate that I've read about recently? Um, but um, the 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 text of Scripture is uh, so often not focused directly on those outcomes. It's first focused on w- telling us about what God Himself has done throughout history. Yeah. Uh, it's a very different, more theocentric and more historical interest that biblical theology brings to us. Biblical theology really uh, is is studying uh, the Bible uh, uh, chronologically, in a sense, to see that uh, the revelation that God has given to us clusters uh, temporally, chronologically, around various events in history, things that God has done. So you see, for example, lots of uh, revelatory activity right around uh, before and after the Exodus mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. Uh, before, obviously, before and after uh, the exile, mm-hmm. uh, restoration, before and after the coming of, of Christ. Uh, and those are just some examples. Um, and so you're trying to say and to, to recognize how the Word of God is characteristically first and foremost interpreting what God has done uh, in history for his people. And we need to take that, uh, we need to see that and take that as our first emphasis uh, um, rather than uh, going directly to what's the meaning of this text for my life, right? I need to see it in its original context. Mm -hmm. And of course, we very much, very strongly uh, want to say that you do need to walk all the way forward to the application of the text of Scripture to our own lives and our own day. We we don't believe in biblical theology as a substitute for uh, application of the text, so right, to speak. Right. But the, really the question is, um, where does the text start? What is its uh, principal emphasis? Uh, it differs from one text to the other. Some of them uh, are more directly about uh, application, we could say. Um, but um, we often miss how the text is continually telling us the good news outside of us, hmm. the good news that exists yeah. prior to and apart from our immediate situation and existence, the good news of what God especially has done in Jesus Christ and in all the other many things throughout the biblical story before and after Christ. The... Uh Totality of Scripture could be compared to um, uh, a body, but it is the history, it is the redemptive history that is the skeleton. And a skeleton always gives shape and solidity to um, a body. Uh, Someone has said that, therefore, the commands and uh, prophetic material is more uh, the tissue, the the muscle and uh, the organs, but it is the skeleton that gives shape to... Mm -hmm the uh, the organism. And therefore, uh, focus has to be on the great things God has done in history, and the history, therefore, that the Bible is concerned with is not something that a modern historiographer would be con- would be yeah. interested in, but it has its own its own interest and uh, its own focus. and that's that's also what gives unity yeah. to the totality of Genesis through revelation. Uh, rather than um, breaking up it into separate theologies or uh, discordant histories here and there. There's one story that is told. It's the story of God's great acts in Christ Jesus, uh, his Son and our Lord. And then the the covenantal life that gathers around that is what gives, uh, shall we say, substance to uh, that which is shaped by the history. You know, and in, a, in our next podcast, we'll actually talk about what what happens with a lot of critical uh, scholarship, those who don't believe this is inspired uh, revelation. Um, but it's interesting how biblical theology, uh, on the one hand, it provides a positive way of of, of unpacking the meaning of this text uh, for for our proclamation, for our preaching. Although it also serves as a good um, antidote to this attempt to break the text up into many histories. It does help to trace that overarching story. Mm -hmm. Um, But 
even bib- what biblical theology, uh, in, again, in this Vossian tradition particularly, has really cued us into the epochal structure of revelation. There's these various epochs. There's there's different moments where God's uh, revelation is coming in certain forms and accomplishing certain uh, certain ends. And there's reasons why things that we read about in the Old Testament and the theocracy are not applicable, at least not directly. That's, there's reasons why we don't uh, engage in sacrifice the way they did in the Old Testament. Or there's reasons we don't engage in some of the same purity laws and things like that. We do find these different epochs that biblical theology orients us to, and that really enables us to read a book like Leviticus, which doesn't tend to be most people's favorite book of the Bible. And yet, a good understanding of biblical theology enables a book like Leviticus to to come to life and to testify in, in really remarkable ways to God's unified plan, uh, all of which is is culminating in the in the the coming of Christ. And it's it's really I I, I remember it was like a the, the light bulb just coming right on when when it when biblical theology began to connect and what prior had felt like such a a scattered and far-flung Bible with all kinds of quirky little corners in it suddenly became a unified story that unfolded. Um, I think that that story, too, is something that plays an amazingly good role in our lives pastorally, uh, practically, because um, we tend to be so focused on ourselves, our immediate situation, what's going on, whether it's in American politics or some other thing uh, that's uh, uh, very recent. Um, and that generally leads to introspection and mm-hmm. concern and fear, uh, anxiety. Um, but biblical theology says we need to place our moment in time uh, within a much larger story, the story of God's work from creation to consummation, the center of which is Jesus Christ, uh, and then to see ourselves caught up into that story and that work, uh, that we first look outside of ourselves to what God uh, has done, chronicled throughout the pages of Scripture, how Scripture testifies to it, interprets it, applies it, uh, and then we see ourselves brought into that large story, which has a future to it, Mm -hmm. has a glorious future Mm -hmm. to it, uh, and it trains us uh, to think about uh, what uh, is true in heaven above now because Christ is there, mm-hmm. the uh, risen and exalted Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and because there is yet more to come still when he returns that trains us to think about that great eschatological, final, ultimate future. Uh, and in that, we see a bigger picture that gives context to our present day yeah. and is encouraging. We go beyond the sort of introspection of our everything immediate to us and place those immediate things inside a larger uh, frame of reference. Uh, it's not uh, instead of being relevant, it actually is very relevant. We as preachers have to describe that relevance. Mm-hmm. We don't just assume it's obvious. We, we, we say, why is this significant to us? But, but first we have to tell them what it is that we want to proclaim is so significant, right? That those great acts of God uh, that consummate in Jesus Christ. And uh, that's the gospel, uh, the gospel of God's son, as, as Paul says in Romans. The gospel, as Dr. Menninger mentioned, is so important and crucial to a seminarian's training. Uh, as they learn the overarching picture of redemptive history in biblical studies and their exegesis classes. But does any of this have any bearing on how we interact with the academy? How is it being practiced, quote unquote, out there, so to speak? It, It might surprise you to know that there are plenty of atheists who engage in biblical studies. Uh, So how should we respond? We'll hear from our faculty on this and more next time on Roundtable. I'm Jared Luchibor. Thank you for joining us. 